Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Stephen Faulkner, and I'm the chief of our field services operations here at Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation Services. Um, and uh, I'm broadcasting out of Mason City, Iowa. Um, um, I'm, I want to thank you very much for allowing me to uh, to uh, talk with you today and talk a little bit about the Iowa Self-Employment Program. This is a program here that I'm very, very proud of. And it's a program with a long history and there have been many, many changes along the way. And I wanted to bring you up to date, especially on some of the newer changes that we brought to the program, which would include um, customized self-employment, which is uh, something that in the past we had never done, but it's really, really been a very, very good service and very popular as well. I'm gonna have um, people read these, um, the headings of the slides as we go through them because I'm a blind guy and I haven't figured out with my JAWS program and Zoom yet how to, how to coordinate the, <laughs> the PowerPoint <laughs> with my talking. So um, here's my, uh, my secretary, Mary Ingersoll, who will just uh, read the, uh, the heading on each slide and then I'll take it from there. <clears throat> the purpose of the IVRS self-employment program. The purpose of the IVRS self-employment program is currently, and really has been for a long time, to help individuals who are citizens of the state of Iowa, who have disabilities and who are eligible for public vocational rehabilitation services, to be able to actualize their self-employment dreams and ideas, um, at a level of independence and self-sustainability that best meets their particular needs and, uh, and desires. The, um, the self-employment program is actually uh, for individuals who are residents of the state of Iowa and who uh, intend to operate their businesses solely uh, from the state of Iowa. Although oftentimes these days uh, with the internet and other types of uh, media possibilities, our businesses may be based here in Iowa, but they can be actually nationwide and sometimes worldwide. Thank you. Next slide, please. A bit of history. The, um, the self-employment process here in the state of Iowa with Iowa DVR has, uh, has, has a long history um, starting back in the before the 1990s, um, I came aboard back in 1988 here in Iowa. And in those days, we had a facility in Des Moines, um, the Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation uh, Facility, which um, basically we could send clients down there to Des Moines, house them for a period of time, and they could do vocational evaluations. Much of those were work samples and uh, Oh, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, testing, uh, computer testing, or or paper and pencil assessments, but oftentimes work samples. And what we did with those who were interested in having some kind of a small business, they would actually be assessed for their understanding and knowledge of managing a business, their ability to to maybe apply simple math um, computations to uh, to the process of keeping their books or uh, computing their their profits, and if they showed the aptitude in these areas, um, they would come back to the field counselor you know, wherever they came from. They would come back with a, a certificate of completion of that program and a recommendation to move forward with uh, putting together a small business. The maximum amount of financial assistance in those days was twenty five hundred dollars. And there really was very little technical assistance provided to the individual to, um, to be able to, uh, to you know, continue and move their business forward. Um, it was really up to the local field counselor to work with that individual to buy some supplies and uh, services up to that $2,500 uh, amount. And then the individual is pretty much on their own, checking back with their VR counselor and vice versa so that they, uh, they could keep things going. Um, Next slide, please. The latter half of the 1990s. Now in the 1990s, um, by, by the middle of the 1990s and, and onward, um, Iowa changed their ways. We actually closed that, uh, the VR facility down in Des Moines. 
um, it just wasn't practical sending people away to do work samples when they could learn the things that they needed to know right, right in their home communities. Um, but we actually hired a, a group who um, helped us put together the Entrepreneurs with Disabilities program for those who are interested in self-employment. So first time that was ever done in Iowa like that. Um, and um, it involved uh, putting together a business plan uh, with a lot of technical assistance to the client putting together that plan. And then oftentimes the EWD staff who are all outside of our agency and contracting with us would actually take over that case work with the person, maybe even develop the plan for them, help them understand as much of it as they could understand. And um, for financial assistance, for supplies and equipment, um, there was a maximum uh, amount that we could put into the program of up to $10,000. Uh, and, and that would be for specific needs of the business. And so if a business only needed a certain amount of money to purchase the supplies to get them up and started, that's how much they could get. And it was all based on a dollar for dollar match. So the individual had to demonstrate match, had to demonstrate no debt to the state of Iowa, uh, like back taxes or alimony or things like that, that, uh, that would cause uh, the state of Iowa to actually try to recoup some of that money. And so um, once they were cleared for that, and if they could put together a business plan that was feasible, then the individual could get that uh, they could get the amount of money that uh, that met their match and that uh, actually could help them to purchase supplies to get started. There was technical assistance um, from the contractors of the program uh, along the way to help the individual maybe with marketing strategies or uh, maybe doing a feasibility study or, or something of that nature. But um, um, if uh, more professional technical assistance had to be provided, um, that was contracted outside. Uh, perhaps it might be a lawyer, uh, perhaps to, uh, to help set up the, the form of the business, uh, you know, whether a corporation, an LLC, things like that. Um, it might be an accountant to help them set up their bookkeeping and, uh, and put together uh, uh, a system for the individual to be able to follow. It might be uh, purchasing something from a graphic designer in terms of the design. Um, the technical assistance is more uh, support service or design, uh, not so much tangible items. And so the financial assistance was limited to the tangible items and the, and the technical to the other. Um, next slide, please. The transition to the ICE program. But in the late 1990s, we were having some real concerns. In fact, this actually gone into the 2000s. We were having some real concerns about the Entrepreneurs with Disabilities Program because with contractors, they were operating it really on their own, um, working with our clients. And sometimes we had very, very little input into how those cases were coming out. Many of the cases were failing in the first year. They, they didn't actually get their businesses up and running. And we were very concerned about that. So we decided to internalize um, the, uh, the program and we called it the Iowa Self-Employment Program, put together a committee of people and uh, uh, let the contractors go. And we designed the program to be similar to what the Entrepreneurs with Disabilities Program was, had the same financial limits, $10,000 technical assistance, $10,000 uh, financial assistance. And with the financial assistance, again, there was a dollar for dollar match. Um, the individual had to be an Iowa resident, eligible for VR services, had to put together um, with minimal technical assistance uh, of a feasible business plan. And uh, they'd have to do a feasibility study. We really raised the bar kind of high because we, we were afraid that uh, poor planning was resulting in uh, poor outcomes for many of our businesses up to that point. So we really raised the bar kind of high and uh, um, we had, uh, we had basically self-education types of modules that the individual would, would study to help them figure out the business plan process. And then we had hired a couple of business development specialists. And these are people from private industry that became uh, uh, employees of Iowa Folk Rehab Services. And, and these folks had technical experience in setting up the business and they would lead the clients through 
that process of feasibility study, putting together uh, a feasible business plan. Um, and uh, the individuals still had to have 51% ownership. They still had to be working towards independence of social security. By the time of case closure, to consider it a successful case, they had to be earning at least 80% of SGA. And technical assistance also included things like assistive technology research and financial assistance would include the assistive technology. This got to be a real problem down the line and I'll cover that in a little bit. Um, we had very, very few businesses started that were successful in those days because so many people that came became frustrated with the process. It was very technical, it was very laborious. It took months to get a business plan in place and get it approved. And unless the business development specialist approved the plan, it didn't go forward. Next slide, please. 2018 and beyond. Um, <clears throat> I became the, I was a, a field supervisor in those days before 2018, but I became the chief of field services um, in that year. And when I did, I took over supervision of the Iowa Self-Employment Pro Program. One of the things that, um, that I was very concerned about it is, as I've just described, the program was very, very difficult for individuals. Uh, it was sort of a situation of many are called and very few are chosen uh, in order to make progress. Lots of our clients maybe had skills, product or a service in some way, but really didn't have that good of a, a background in, in business. And even our field counselors felt like they, they really didn't know business well enough to provide a lot of input to our programs. And what began to happen was that the business development specialists that we had were basically running the program just like the EWD program had done in the, in the previous years. I wanted to bring the rehabilitation counselor back in as a, as a vital part of this program and to have them uh, providing the counseling and guidance, those specialized rehabilitation services that we, uh, we are expected by the public to provide. Uh, the counseling and guidance, the search for assistive technology. And I didn't want to have assistive technology to be a part of the self-employment program. I wanted that to be something that we did independent of them so that we could, we could spare those dollars and uh, the clients would have more dollars to apply towards directly to their business. Um, it also made it possible for some of our farmers who didn't own 51% of their business or perhaps did not really care to have the, the small business program, but just needed um, assistive technology, it allowed us to go ahead and serve them independent of the, um, of the small business development program. Um, many, many of the farmers who, who needed adaptive devices or equipment for their fields um, that, uh, that we could provide through assistive technology and through a partnership with the Easter Seals Rural Solutions Program, they were able to actually um, receive those services and then continue in their farming without having to do a business plan or go through all that process. But of course, that was always open to them if they needed it as well. The 51% uh, rule was eliminated. I mean, it's, it's still there as a recommendation that there be 51% ownership. Um, I noticed in reviewing the various states around the union that uh, Iowa was one of the few that actually had such a, such a high percentage of ownership. Some states had, had maybe one or 2% ownership. There was nothing in the federal regulations that really called for uh, such, uh, such an ownership percentage. And so that was eliminated. It's, it's, it's called a best practice, but it's easily waived uh, through an exception request. And the reason that's important is because many of the farmers and maybe other types of businesses um, these days, um, the individual may, it might be part of a family operation and, or, or it might be a corporation. And maybe they just don't own that much of the business, but they are the driving force in the business. That's where their primary income is coming from. And so that made it possible for us to work with that population as well. One of the other things that I was concerned about was since um, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act calls us to such a, such a high standard in, in thinking outside of the box and providing um, really relevant services to the general public, um, 
whether or not they have uh, a history of uh, a strong employment history, um, we we need to move that uh, we need to move the compass needle for for those folks and and get more and more people into really relevant and uh, and productive jobs in a fully integrated setting. And I felt like that applied to our small business candidates as well. So we introduced the concept of customized um, self-employment, which means that the individual may may be independent in providing a service or uh, a product of some kind, or he may need to have coaching and some kind of personal assistance in order to get that done and possibly needs to have some assistance uh, in, um, in actually managing and maintaining the business. Uh, but as long as that individual um, is, uh, is able to produce the product or provide the service, even with a reasonable accommodation, we have found ways to, uh, to try to make that happen for individuals. We also eliminated the 80% of SGA rule because there's really nothing in the regulations that say that um, an individual has to earn a certain amount of money. For a lot of the individuals that we're working with in customized employment, we can really impact their lives and provide a great deal of, of self-worth and dignity for them, the, the pride of ownership of a business, even if they need help. And some of these businesses over time really, really become quite impressive. Next slide, please. Changes in our ICE program from January 2018. <laughs> Well, this is the slide that I just talked about. So we won't spend a lot of time on that, but you can see in the bullet points the kinds of things that I've been talking about that I think are really, really critical. I do want to say that the customized self-employment um, programs that we've added to our, uh, our self-employment uh, package, um, those, those have been very, very important to um, the, uh, the community of individuals here in Iowa who have very significant disabilities, who some of them may never have been able to work outside of uh, day have work, or maybe some of them have only ever been able to work in a sheltered setting, and yet they have a skill and they have an ambition. Um, it is something that a lot of the local advocacy groups, and I do believe uh, uh, the, uh, the sponsors of WIOA, uh, appreciate the opportunity for these folks to actually um, have a business and have it go forward. We've got some really, really fine um, success stories. And in the next webinar by Cochelle, um, she's actually going to talk about some of those successes and what they look like and how we actually got things to work. Next slide, please. Okay. So what does ICE look like today? Okay. Well, our ISE program today, um, we really take all comers that uh, come to our program. There still is an application. We have actually revised the application to make it a lot more user-friendly, uh, more customer-friendly. It actually gives a timeline, timeline at the top of the application form, which is an online form, but it can be printed and used um, individually with folks as well. Um, that particular timeline has been something that many of our clients have requested over the years. Um, they find the program, it's a very large complex program and it takes a long time to get through it. Every single situation is very, very different. One of the big complaints has been, um, I, I just had no idea this was gonna take so long. I didn't realize how much work there was gonna be. How do I know where I'm at in the program? Um, and so what we tried to do instead of bombarding them, which is tons and tons of forms as we've done in the past, uh, which many of them are just, they glaze over when they see the forms and they just aren't quite sure still what's gonna happen. Um, what we've done is we've designed this thing <clears throat> to be uh, an accessible, fillable form that uh, we can actually work with the individual on completion of it. It comes in sections and it, and it begins with basic information and it leads on to some of the questions that that we want to know about, you know, what their what their income level is like at this point. Um, uh, we still look to see whether or not they're in debt to uh, the state of Iowa or to the feds. We um, 
we start to get an idea as we go through this, what their business concept might be and what questions they may have at that point. And, um, and like I said, it comes in chunks and sections. So we complete one section at a time with the individuals. And um, again, it's user friendly, but because it's in sections and because it operates in kind of a linear fashion uh, and according to that timeline that we have up at the top of it, um, the clients and the counselors out in the field are able to follow along with that. They know exactly what's going to come next. And uh, there's also links to the various forms that may be uh, needed. And so um, it's very, very simple for the counselors to really, really be on board though. With, with some of our field counselors, they, they don't do a lot of these. And, and uh, again, they maybe aren't as familiar with the program, but this really maps it out for them and uh, makes it a lot, a lot easier to follow. And it's a lot easier to swallow too, because even though it's a large form, we take it in sections and we are willing to work individually with the people in, in going ahead and completing those things. Again, the 51% uh, rule is pretty much eliminated. What we consider to be self-sustaining is a business that we're not gonna have to inject continual VR funds into to keep it going. And so uh, the days are gone when we had to have uh, at least a level of 80% uh, SGA. We're really looking now at what makes the best sense for that individual in their life. And for many of them, they do want to make a lot of money and they have the capacity to do that. We try to help them through marketing, uh, technical assistance and uh, accounting technical assistance. We've even brought in a benefits planner to actually be a part of many of these cases. And this is a lady who helped design the benefits program in Iowa. So she's also an employee of IVRS and she kind of leads our state as a resource manager in everything that has to do with benefits planning she becomes a vital part of this. And so it becomes a team now between the business development specialist, uh, a benefits planner, and a local counselor and supervisor. They're all very much involved. Each has their part. The counselor providing the counseling and guidance, assistive technology, um, linking up with the benefits planner to make sure that that's taken into account and that we look for all of those possible things. And then of course, the business development specialist who helps with the business planning process. We don't necessarily go with a, uh, an SBA loan type business plan. Um, the formal business plan like that is often used if we're gonna need to apply for outside loans, um, specifically um, loans uh, from perhaps a bank or some other organization that requires a very detailed business plan. Uh, but even getting a past plan for a business isn't really that technical. Uh, there's a few key points on there that have to be covered. And we've kind of gone to a canvas process for many of those. And I think Cochelle in her next webinar can really talk to you about what that canvas looks like. But it's a much simplified way of, of looking at it, a way that laymen can understand the business concept much more easily. And that's been something that we've, uh, that we've really uh, been pleased with. And uh, it seems to work for past cadre, and it also seems to work well for the businesses that really don't need that detailed of a plan. And it's not nearly so frustrating for the clients that are going through our program. Um, the limits, the dollar limits are still the same, 10,000 for financial assistance and 10,000 for technical assistance, all based on a matching formula for the uh, financial assistance. But if the individual doesn't have the money to match, um, there are ways we can waive the match, we can, uh, we can bring in other organizations like the Iowa Able Fund who can, uh, who can help provide some basic loans and, and uh, those loans can be uh, supported through that agency and uh, that can add to what we have. The past programs are a possibility. We also look with our customized um, uh, self-employment programs, we're also looking to the local DHS um, case managers, the county case managers, the waiver programs here in the state of Iowa. And we have managed care organizations here in Iowa, which are private organizations that provide case management. And we've developed relationships with those as well. Um, this has been um, a little bit interesting to try to figure out how to get the right supports for those who are having the customized self-employment program. Uh, it's a work in progress. Every case is a little bit different but we're finding ways to make it work. Next slide, please. 
the full self-employment program. In Iowa these days, we have actually two parts to our self-employment program. One of them we call the full self-employment program, which is what I've just described, um, the $10,000 maximum limit for financial assistance and the 10,000 technical assistance, um, the need for match and that type of thing. Um, those are very involved programs. They, they operate from a feasible business plan, which the individual uh, is responsible for, but who receive a lot of technical assistance in getting that done. Um, the other thing that we've recently added, because so many people today are contract workers um, and they really don't need that level of business support, uh, we call it the micro enterprise program. And that's a much um, abbreviated program that um, uh, really the dollar limits on that are $1,500 uh, for financial assistance and $1,500 for technical assistance. And again, the technical assistance is more design or a service being provided like from a lawyer or an accountant, something on that order. Um, the tangible items are still um, uh, the, uh, the supplies and the equipment or things like that that may be needed. But again, the reason for this particular program is it may, be, it may mean that what the person really needs is to get going quickly on this business. Um, it may be that they get a job with a company, but it's really not a job where they're considered an employee, but they're considered a contractor. And because we consider that it takes some special skills to be able to you know, account for your, um, your earnings and, uh, and you, have to, you have to pay in your, your tax estimates and you have to keep good records of, of what your income is and what your expenses are and that type of thing. Um, that's why we provide basic technical assistance through the business development specialists. Um, they're available to help that person set the thing up. If they have trouble with bookkeeping, if they're having trouble with their accounting processes, um, we can provide that uh, technical assistance to them. Again, the counselors and the local supervisors um, are involved with the, uh, the VR counseling and assistive technology accommodations types of things. Um, benefits planners can be available too. Many of the ones who are using the micro enterprise, um, they don't need the benefits planning and they're, maybe they're not on benefits. But the bottom line of it is this, this actually expedites the, the process. So a person can take a contract job and it might be getting a, a seat in a cosmetology salon or it might be uh, somebody who's trying to set up a uh, a massage therapy program, or it might be somebody who's working for an organization uh, from their home on a computer and they're doing this on a contract basis. Um, they may need very, very little financial assistance, but maybe what they really need is some accommodation or um, assistive technology, or maybe a little bit of technical assistance to help them keep their books and make sure that they stay on track. So um, that's the purpose of that. Um, there's no match requirement in this micro enterprise program. And there's no real business plan um, that's required. We don't get that deep into it. We basically map out the process, who they're gonna be contracted to or with, and um, how they're gonna keep their books and uh, what equipment or supplies they do need. And we get them started. So the uh, next slide, please. How Iowa defines financial and technical assistance. Well, and again, and I've talked about this several times and uh, you can see the bullet points here and it's probably more complete than what I've actually said. But this is something that clients oftentimes don't understand is that we do separate out financial assistance from technical assistance. And again, the financial assistance, um, we code it differently on our computers because um, it, uh, it has uh, a different, it's not really money from a different pot, but it's, it's definitely um, part of the limits of our program. And we want to be able to keep track of what we're spending in each category on these things. But the financial assistance has to do with actual supplies or equipment, tangible things. We don't buy property. Um, we can buy motor vehicles if it's for the business. Um, we actually have a business going down in the southern eastern part of Iowa where somebody is has actually purchased vans and they're driving uh, people from the Amish community to appointments and to um, 
shopping or different kinds of things that have to happen down there. And that business has actually grown and they purchased a couple of more vans to go with their business. Um, that was the main thing that that person needed was a van to get started and a little technical assistance to help her set up the business. But that was, um, those are the kinds of things you do with financial assistance. The technical assistance again has to do with, uh, you know, really providing um, information, um, providing uh, direction, design, those types of things. And typically we're, we're consulting attorneys or, or um, accountants or maybe designers of some type, graphic designers. So if we have business cards, the design of the card comes out of that pot of technical assistance and the cards themselves are considered the supplies, the hard tangibles, and they come out of the financial assistance. And in this way, we can actually, I think, maximize the individual's ability to, to utilize funds from both pots. Again, we put a lot of stock in benefits planning with these, and uh, we try to work very hard to make sure that all the possible resources um, um, are, are available. The Iowa ABLE Foundation has been very, very helpful for this. And again, our Iowa Easter Seals Rural Solutions Program has provided a lot of opportunities uh, to work in tangency with us, to work together with us in, uh, in terms of uh, looking at assisted aids and devices. Um, that has been um, one of the areas that I think has really, really grown. We have a very larger number now of, uh, well, Iowa's a farm state and we have a much larger a uh, group of individuals coming to us just for technical assist or just for um, <laughs> assistive technology. And um, uh, we have individuals who farm that don't have any legs, uh, maybe an arm is missing or somebody's had cancer or uh, maybe they're deaf. Um, we have an individual right now who's setting up a business in Des Moines. It's a cosmetology business and he's deaf. And uh, we've been able to work with him and get it all put together. It's been really, really uh, an amazing process for us. Next slide, please. IDRS agency expectations for both micro enterprise development and the full self-employment program. Well, I'm gonna let you look at the bullet points on this one. It's really most of the information that I've covered. Um, again, we, we really wanna have individuals um, who are not in debt, uh, we do an income offset form uh, with the state of Iowa. And um, I think what has happened in the past is sometimes people get in debt and then if they use their own social security number for the business, anything that we authorize will go to that debt. So we, we try to make sure that that's cleared up. It's not necessarily a deal breaker if they owe money to the state of Iowa. They just have to be making an effort to make the payments, maybe have a payment plan in place to go and, and help them do that. Um, we want to have citizens of the state of Iowa who are eligible for ER. We want to have individuals who actually have a skill or a service that they, that they know a lot about that they can provide, and we try to work with them on that. Um, if there's aids and devices, if there's accommodations, we want to make sure those are in place. If uh, there's job readiness issues, uh, medications, um, um, uh, maybe selective uh, uh, types of environments that one needs to work in. We want to make sure that those are covered as well. Um, with our microenterprise program, the supervisor and the counselor and the client are the ones actually leading that program and the business development specialists, they're mainly for some technical assistance. Um, on, uh, on the full ice program, the business development specialist has a much more involved role in actually setting up the, the um, the expectations and uh, in the business plan and working with the individual to get a, an appropriate business plan in place, um, find all the, uh, the funds that may be needed. Uh, again, our idea of self-sustaining has to do more with what's right for the client and what's going to bring the most value to their lives um, more than it does any specific dollar amount. They do have to be making some kind of a profit. And our hope is, and what we're really hoping for all along all of our programs is that when they're stabilized, the way that we evaluate that stability is that we're not putting in more money. It doesn't mean that they may not have uh, a need to get a loan from time to time, but it does mean that tomorrow, even without VR, they're gonna still be in business. 
and they're likely to be still in business a year from now. Um, we consider that to be um, stability and we, we usually will close our files successfully there. Next slide, please. Okay. Slides 12 through 14 are customized self-employment, more on customized self-employment and more about customized self-employment. <laughs> um, why don't you read me a couple of the bullet points there, Mary? <laughs> Customized self-employment is the newest and most significant change in the ICE program. This is really the purpose of, of this uh, webinar. I know I've talked a lot about our program in general and the history of it. And I wanted to give you kind of a sense um, that it's been around a long time, but it has really, really grown. But I think the most significant change to our program has been bringing into being the, the customized employment process. Um, there are a lot of issues with this. Um, some of those issues really involve unplowed, unplowed ground for us. We, uh, we have to figure a way that individuals, and they're generally on Social Security, who have never worked before independently and really need to have some personal assistance when they do the process. And it may be a lot of personal assistance, it may be just a little, um, but who's gonna provide that? And for how long will it go? One of the big challenges has been that with our managed care organizations and our waiver programs, you know, there may be limits on how long that or how many hours in a day that they may provide um, those services. Um, and so uh, given that the individual can't really continue the business without the coaching, um, that can bring things to a screeching halt. So we had to find ways around that in many situations. It's been family members that have come in and uh, basically donated their time privately to work with the individual or maybe provide that guidance that they need, maybe help them with the marketing and the bookkeeping. Maybe the individual themselves can provide the service, but they just need somebody there to help keep them um, you know, on task or get the supplies and materials ready that they're gonna need to operate their business. Um, we've had situations where uh, people have, uh, uh, they had their um, own accounts, they've hired individuals, and, and, and in some of our cases, these uh, businesses have developed uh, to the point that uh, the individual can actually hire someone or um, and, you know, have somebody else working in the business and helping to generate that income. So um, it, uh, it's a, a different situation depending on the situation at hand. I mean, the waiver may cover what we need for the person. It may be at a level that it works out. If it's too much more, we have to get very, very creative. Sometimes uh, through our, um, our social security benefit packages, we can find ways uh, to, uh, to assist the individual in getting the support that they need. But that has been probably the biggest struggle for us uh, because the waiver system hasn't really been set up for customized self-employment. So we've had to find some creative ways. But we have a couple of businesses, um, one of them that I can think of right now that's uh, been around for 12 years. It's a coffee shop over in Independence, Iowa. And the young lady has, a, um, has an intellectual disability, um, but she's a very public person and really, really loves to greet her guests when they come to, uh, to her uh, cafe. Um, there are scones there. I've had those scones. They're wonderful. She bakes them. And, uh, and then she's there to interact with the customers and serve them. So it's a, it's a lovely business and it's been going on for, for many, many years now. So um, customized self-employment does work and it brings tremendous value and pride to the individuals who get to be part of it. And I've noticed here in Iowa, of course, again, we're a very small and rural state, but the, the local communities become very, very proud of their citizens who operate businesses um, like this. And if it's a person with disabilities, uh, there's really a lot of local ownership. Uh, we have a fire starter business um, over in Dubuque, Iowa, and that business has actually gone national. But there's a local hardware chain that actually has adopted uh, this uh, young man. He's a gentleman with autism and uh, he, uh, he needs to have coaching whenever he's on duty, but he builds the fire starters himself with donated materials and 
family members are um, helping him as a part of the business. He's also about to hire somebody to be a coach and a fellow worker. And uh, the bottom line of it is this business is going very well too, and it is going national. So uh, very, very nice outcome for a thing like this. Um, the next couple of slides, I think, are going to just summarize some of these points. Next slide, please. Oh, this one is more uncustomized self-employment. And what's the first bullet point? Okay. In customized self-employment, the candidate receives personal assistance from the VR counselor, the BDS, and a family member or guardian in developing a Canvas-type business plan. And again, we, um, we try to make this as non-threatening and as understandable as we possibly can. And even people like me who have several college degrees have difficulty understanding our old business uh, development process. And so um, certainly our individuals with disabilities uh, will have that difficulty too without the personal assistance. But the Canvas process has been very helpful. And then having a whole team of people working on this, not just the business development specialist, but the benefits planner and the rehab, rehab counselor and sometimes the supervisor. Um, and then maybe partner agencies like Iowa ABLE could be involved and having a, a, a group of people around them and then including the family members and the waivers, the case managers, we can really put together a program um, that, that really works well uh, for the individual. But we're not so concerned about the ability for them to do the entire process independently. At one point in time, we were. And I believe that in several states now today, it is expected that candidates for self-employment have to be pretty much independent. They have to be pretty much able to manage their business and operate things and to do that without a lot of personal support. Um, here in Iowa, we've, we've altered that with customized self-employment. And whatever supports or uh, accommodations that may be needed for the person, that becomes part of their program if we can do it. Next slide. Okay. Next okay. slide, please. More about customized employment. Many or most of these candidates may require personal assistance for job coaching mm -hmm. for some of all of their activities in the business. So special care is taken to ensure that coaching will be continuously available at the level required through a variety of sources which might include county and state waivers and case management services through private managed care organizations, even volunteers from the family or community or combinations of the above. When and if the business is able to net suitable profits, the business might even hire helpers. One of the hazards of having a blind guy give a seminar like this, uh, I, I already talked about this, but now you get to see it in print in case I messed it up the first time. So you get to look at it this way and um, I hope it answers some of your questions. Um, next slide, please. Some outcomes of the customized self-employment program. Okay. At the present time, there are, are over 13 customized self-employment businesses in various stages of development. Okay, uh, and that's, uh, that's a really, really huge point for us. Um, whereas a couple of years ago, we didn't have any. Um, we now have over 13 customized um, self-employment programs in the state of Iowa. And just to give you a perspective, right now we have over 200 um, self-employment cases between microenterprise and the full ISC program. We have over 200 cases in operation right now, but 13 of those are, um, are customized self-employment programs and are making good progress. Next slide. Some statistics from all Iowa ACE programs, federal fiscal year 2020 back to 2013, program year 2020 statistics. I'll let you look at these statistics um, in, the, uh, in the slides that follow. I have statistic, statistics for the fiscal year 20 um, on there, and you can see um, a fairly high level of uh, of uh, referrals for the self-employment program. There's a high caseload number. Um, and the, um, the actual successful closures, which really reflect the, the work of maybe two or three previous years, we tend to follow our cases a while. Um, so they actually come to fruition and we can get our closures. 
And uh, what is it, 40 closures that we see there? Uh, let's see, 40. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, um, and then if we look at the next slide for the previous fiscal year, you'll see that the number of closures was quite a bit less. 26. Yeah, there was 26 altogether. Um, the previous year and the next slide will give you an idea. Um, it was still lower, but it was kind of higher than last year, but it was, uh, it was still uh, lower than what we had in fiscal 20. And I guess what I'm trying to get at is that our program is growing. We only have two business development specialists right now, one covering the eastern end of Iowa and one covering the west. And um, like I said, over 200 cases that are active and we got more coming in every day. It would be very difficult for those business development specialists to give the time and attention to each one of these um, that they need to do without having the team approach that we offer today. The counselor, the local supervisor, the benefits planner, the local case manager, such, such as that. Um, these cases take a lot of effort and a lot of work, um, but as we approach them as a team, everybody having their own responsibilities for their part of the business plan, these things, they actually move forward very well. And we do wind up then having the time to devote to the more complex cases of trying to figure out how to provide the, the appropriate supports and needs of the customized uh, self-employment population as we go on. So I think you can see our program is growing. And uh, I think we're very, very proud of the number of actual successful businesses. We do continue to track them for a few years because we will send um, actually um, letters requesting um, you know, basic income information for the next few years, just so that we can, uh, well, for one thing, keep track of, keep track of uh, second and fourth quarter um, income levels on these folks, but mainly just uh, to make sure that they're still going on with their program and that they're not having difficulties. And they can always check back with our business development specialists if they need something else along the way. Um, uh, that, that has been a, a real great service. And so, we develop quite a relationship with our, uh, especially our customized self-employment programs. And uh, so anyway, next slide, please. <laughs> well, this is uh, statistics from uh, federal fiscal year 2017. Yeah, and we'll just keep, next slide. Next slide, okay. uh -huh. The variety of business types through ICE programs from federal fiscal year 2016 back to federal fiscal year 2014. These are all the different kinds of business programs. Now, but what I want to talk about first is the customized self-employment program. You might wonder what kind of businesses that we've actually uh, developed with these. I've talked about the fire starter business. That's, uh, that's the young gentleman who uses donated um, dryer lint and uh, other materials that are donated to make these fire starters, which he packages, and they're very attractively packaged and can be purchased through... Um, uh, a local uh, hardware chain that we have or can be purchased online. They've even put in a line of sweaters and, and uh, cups and things like that for marketing purposes that a person can purchase through this. And uh, these folks have actually gone up to the state of Wisconsin and over to Illinois and they've actually visited state parks and, and uh, marketed in those areas. And then they market a lot over the internet. Um, this business is getting larger and larger all the time. And uh, so that, uh, that's, been, that's been a really, really creative one. But we also have an, ind an industry going on in Southern Iowa right now where a young man uh, with autism is, is actually welding um, iron junk <laughs> and uh, making art designs with it, which is becoming very, very popular. And in his last year of high school, he started uh, doing this on his own and he sold about $15,000 worth of, of his uh, art projects. So now he's going to go into it full time and we're helping him to do that. I mentioned, uh, we also have an individual um, who's doing dress design. And this is somebody with a uh, uh, intellectual disability, but they have a real flair for design and they're putting in quite a line. Um, this individual gets some help from family members, but for the most part is really doing a, a ni nice job of the designing thing. This business is still in process of being stabilized. Um, 
we have uh, folks who do um, paper shredding. And uh, one that I can think of over in the western part of the state of Iowa, she needs a lot of coaching and can only work a few hours a week. And yet, um, with the right equipment and a little bit of help from her, her uh, coaches, she can stay on track and is actually earning money um, doing paper shredding for local businesses. So these are, uh, these are very intensely interesting programs. And Coach Ellen in the next webinar is gonna talk about some of these and you get to see what they look like. Um, you know, how we actually arrived at uh, uh, how the coaching would be done and how often and uh, what we considered stabilization. I think she's gonna actually talk about that in the next webinar. And the next slide. Okay, this is the last slide. And for more information about ICE, you may contact Stephen Faulkner or Coach okay. Al. And uh, this is my final slide and my sign off. And I got to tell you that uh, at the end of tomorrow, I'm actually retiring. I'm a 68 year old bureau chief here in Iowa, and uh, it's time for me to go. But Coach Al will stay on with us. And if you have questions or uh, concerns or anything that you want to talk about about this uh, this program. Um, uh, our next presenter, Cochelle, is one that you could contact. I will say about that last slide, too, if you have the opportunity, uh, many of the businesses that you see there um, are not just simply customized employment, but they're, um, uh, they're uh, uh, all of our self-employment programs. And we, um, we've had just a variety. There's quite a variety of different types of career ideas and um, some of them are so novel, it's, it's hard to believe looking at them that if we ever came up with some of those ideas. The, uh, the clients that we work with have tremendous potential and are very, very proud of their businesses. Uh, I was able to actually sit in on, a, on a, uh, uh, a business plan meeting with the deaf individual down in Des Moines who's going to be a cosmetologist in a kind of, we have a, a very high highbrow hotel in Des Moines, a very swanky place. And he gets to have a couple of office spots there and he's setting up quite a business, gonna be hiring employees. That business isn't quite off the ground yet, but it's, it's very, very close. The Iowa Able Foundation helped us with, a, with a, an exist, uh, a, an, another loan to go along with the program because our, our process didn't, didn't afford enough information or uh, enough financial assistance for all the equipment needs that he had. Um, and here too, we had the, the special need of, of looking at assistive technology and ways that he was gonna communicate with, uh, with our um, business development specialists. So we had interpreters every time uh, that happened and then working with him on how he'd communicate with his coworkers and his clients. So um, that's been a really, really exciting process to, to see that go. This man was just so happy and um, fired up and uh, uh, we're very, very, very proud of many of these businesses. They're, they're going on just fine. Uh, and that's the end of our webcast for today. And I do thank you very much for your attention and apologize for the ringing that you heard in the background. We're having a hailstorm today here in Iowa. Thank you very much. <laughs>